Amen. How are we doing this morning? Doing good? Awesome. Hey, if you want to flip in your Bibles or on your phones, we're going to be in Ephesians. The book of Ephesians uh, will be in uh, chapter 1 a little bit and chapter 4 this morning, okay? A little bit there. Uh, if you haven't noticed, we sang a bunch of songs about hope this morning. And I love it. Every single song had the word, word hope in it besides the anthem this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about hope, about what real hope looks like. Amen. My sermon title this morning is entitled Real Hope. Everybody say Real Hope. hope. My prayer is that you have real, authentic hope. Amen? Real, authentic hope. Recently, uh, I was driving through the city of Cincinnati, and uh, I came across this billboard on the side of UC Hospital. And... uh, now, I'm not bashing UC Hospital when I say this. I, I love hospitals. I love what they do, right? Amen? I love what they do. I love that God has created us as human beings to be very creative and to be able to do amazing things that I cannot even fathom, right? I cannot even fathom. Like, like uh, I remember like my mom a couple years ago had a hip replacement. On Friday, she's in the, in the gym jogging, right? Like, how is it even possible that that can happen? How is it even possible that you can put a pacemaker in? And how, how, how are, like, that stuff is amazing. And it's because God has created us as human beings to be very creative and brilliant. Because we're made in His image, amen? We're made in His image. All right? But I, I did find this billboard that I saw uh, across the side of UC Hospital to be very interesting. This is what it said. In science lives hope. And as soon as I saw it, I typed it in my notes on my phone. So that's going, to be a, that's going to be in a sermon somewhere. In science lives hope. I thought, that is so wrong in all ways. It's so wrong. Like, this is what the world thinks. This is what the world thinks hope resides. Then they have got it all wrong. And I love science. I am a science nerd, right? My wife is a science teacher, right? In science does not live hope. In Jesus, we have hope. In Jesus lives our hope. And he is living. He sits at the right hand of the Father right now. Right? He intercedes for us to the Father. There's my hope. There's my hope. This this phrase has two, two really main problems that I just want to just touch quickly, and then I want to go talk about hope, okay? Real hope. The first one is this. Science is not a living thing. It's not, it's not a living, breathing thing. Nothing actually lives in science. It's, it's not a living thing. It can't do things. I'm, I'm not bashing the hospital for, for their quote. I'm just saying this is the world we live in where we get things wrong. And we, we start to worship the created things above the Creator. We start to worship our, our knowledge and our wisdom and our logic and, and what we can discover instead of the One who allows us to discover it. We start to worship the stuff over the One who created all the stuff. Right? You can think of so many things that this is true about. People are worshiping uh, what the Bible calls mammon, money, things, materials, when God's the one created all that and created us in His image so that we could create things. People are worshiping it. In our culture and in many cultures around the world, people, men and women, are worshiping sex when it was created by God for a man and a woman. We're worshiping it. We're dressing in ways to attract it. And our culture says it's okay. We begin to worship the created things over the Creator. And here's what my point is. In created things, hope does not reside. In the Creator, that's where hope resides. Second point. So science is not a living thing. Nothing can live in science. Right? Second thing is this. People do science. It's not the science that is amazing. It's the people who do it who are made in the image of God. Right? Right? There's a great, great quote by an, a Christian apologist named Frank Turek. He says this right here. He says, science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. Science doesn't say anything. 
It's the people who are doing science who say something. It's the people who are doing the, the work that get the results, and then they have to articulate those to us. Or we have to articulate them ourselves. He's right. Ultimately, we are the ones doing science. Ultimately, we're the ones creating experiments and getting the research and doing the, doing the work. God just created the logic and the things that we do. He created us to be brilliant. We are, we are, we are we're different than all other creatures because we have this amazing mind and the amazing things that we can do. That's why God says He made us in His image. Amen? Like We can do some of the most amazing things. Last night I'm driving through the city of Chicago looking at Sears Tower. Like, how in the world is that possible that we can do some of the stuff that we can do? We're amazing because God is amazing and we are made in His image. But the fact that people do science creates a problem. Because people have their biases. Amen? People have their, their preconceived notions. Look at, look at this. I just want to give you an example of what I mean here, okay? Here's some, some startling things that are going on in our, in our culture, in our world, that people believe that they base on science. They try to articulate the results. Do you know that 13% of Americans say that Bigfoot is real? 13%! Nothing, we have no results of that. Right? I'm just starting off with funny ones so we can get to more serious ones here in a second, okay? 13% of Americans say Bigfoot is real. I was like, you got to be kidding me, right? The other day, I, I was watching a documentary a little bit um, about these, this group of people called Flat Earthers, right? Anybody ever seen this before? There are literally conventions for people who believe the earth is still flat, right? Not joking. Look it up, okay? 2% of Americans believe the earth is flat, Contrary to all the pictures from space that we have that the earth is round. <laughs> right? Seriously, I'm not joking. Thir or 2% of Americans believe the earth is flat. They have science conventions with people who are trying to convince the world that the earth is flat. It's hilarious. Sorry, it's just comical, honestly. Okay? The earth is flat. And here's their... Just, I saw one guy... This is a science experiment. He sets up like a laser or something and he's looking out and he says, it just stays the same. It doesn't hit. If the earth was round, it would, it would hit or it would do something. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Anyways, the earth is round, right? Now let's get to some serious ones here. Babies have a heartbeat at six weeks. Yet in our culture, people want to say, they want to, contrary to what science says, they want to say that life doesn't start in the womb. It starts when a child comes out of the womb. Six weeks, a baby has a heartbeat. Life begins at conception. Life begins in the womb. Whether you want to listen to science or not, this is why people doing science is awesome and yet bad at the same time. Because people have to listen to the logical results and conclusion that we get. So I, I just bashed the left a little bit. Now let's bash the right a little bit. The global temperature in our world has risen, contrary to some belief, okay? We have caused the temperature to rise. Global warming is real. That's why we get this crazy weather that we get sometimes, okay? Whether or not you want to listen to the, to the, the logical conclusions of science or not, it is real. Just like a baby having a heartbeat at six, beats, six weeks is real. Right? So peop, this is why science, this can't have our hope because we bring all these preconceived notions and people take the results and do what they want with them. We've got to find real hope, amen? We've got to find real hope in Jesus. Biology would tell us there are two genders. But yet contrary to that, people don't want to believe it. Pin drop. Truth is, God created people male and female, Amen? And science does not live hope. In the truth lives hope. And last time I checked, Jesus said, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. Right. Science does not have our hope. I want to talk about real hope this morning. Let's say, everybody say it with me. Real hope. Real hope. Amen. Let's flip to Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 1. 
Look at this, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 real quick, and then we'll be spending most of our time in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 23. This is what Paul says here to the church in Ephesus. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you have been called. Matt just talked about how God is calling us, amen? amen. God is calling us. But he's also calling us to walk worthy of the calling. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Look at this. This is what I want us to really focus. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. There's one Lord one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Now I want you to pick up on this for a second. Look at all the ones. I just highlighted one of them on the screen for you. We, as Christians, we have how many hopes? One hope. We have one hope. We have how many spirits? One spirit of God that now dwells in us if we are believers in Jesus Christ. How many baptisms? One. Contrary to what some want to, churches want to preach. Now you're baptized in water one time and then you're baptized in the Spirit a different time. No. If you believed in Jesus, you had the Spirit of God dwelling within you. You were baptized in the Spirit. One baptism. One Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? One faith. One baptism, one God and Father of all. Notice here the, the triune God in Ephesians. Ephesians is full of Trinity references. We have how, how many spirits? One spirit, the Holy Spirit. We have how many lords? One Lord. And we have one God, the Father of all. Look at that. He's putting them all together there for us. So we have, we have one hope. Paul alludes to this. You've been, if you've been called to know Jesus, if you've been called to this calling, walk worthy, but you have one hope as you've been called to Jesus. There's one hope for us. And it is in the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen? Our hope is in Him. Our hope is in God. We have one hope. Now, he is referencing back to Ephesians chapter 1 where he talks about hope to start the, to start the book. Okay, so he's, he's referencing back to Ephesians chapter 1. So we want to talk about this hope that we have in Jesus. Why do we have hope? Why do we have hope in God? For a few reasons, okay? And he talks about them in Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 23. There are many in this room that you seem like, like there's no hope in the situation that you're in. It looks down and out, amen? Right? It looks down and out. It looks like there's no hope. It's miserable no hope. I believe in a God that gives us hope. Amen? amen? Hope for a future. Whether it's here or there. Amen? Whether it's here or there. Hope for a future. Hope that things can change. That things can change. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 23. Flip there with me. Let's spend our time here this morning. Ephesians 1, starting at verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, this church must be doing something right because Paul has heard what they're doing. Amen? I pray that people are hearing what we're doing here. Right? If people in our community aren't hearing about what we're doing, then we're not doing something right. People need to hear about what Revive is doing. Our, our testimony should be going out to the community around us. Our testimony should be going out to the surrounding communities, to the state, to the country, to the world. People should be hearing about what God is doing in Revive, at Revive Church in Dry Ridge, Kentucky. Amen? Amen? Paul's hearing about what's going on in Ephesus. And notice here, he says, I heard about your faith, your willingness to trust God, to trust Christ, and your love for each other. Your love for each other. Let's keep on going. I do not cease to give thanks for you, 
remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Having, eyes of, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is your hope, what is the hope to which He has called you. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that He, might, that he worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now I want to just think about a couple things here as we uh, go back to the beginning of the scripture in Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. I've highlighted a couple words on the screen for you in Ephesians chapter 1. Now look at this, please. Look at this. He says... Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. The word enlightened actually means just having my, my eyes opened. That's what it means. The word enlightened just means it's open. It's, 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 in the Greek, I believe the word is oida. It's about my eyes being opened. And this is a common like, metaphor in the Bible. I once was blind, but now I see. see right? So talking about literally seeing, yeah, Jesus healed some blind people. But more importantly than that, He opened their eyes to the fact that He is the Son of God. Right? He opened their eyes physically, but more importantly than that, He opened their eyes to who He is and the power that He has and the fact that God sent Him to seek and to save the sinners and save the lost. Right? So, so Paul's saying, what I really want to happen for you as believers, I want you to know this. Look at this. He says that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. God wants the eyes of our heart to be open to the knowledge of Him, the revelation of Him. Some of you this morning are still blind. You may be able to see me up here preaching, but you have not come to see the fact and who God is. You have not come to see the fact that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. You have not come to see the fact that Jesus did die on the cross for your sins and that He was raised on the third day to give you new life. You have not come to really see. You have not come to have the hope that you should have. Some believers in this place, like, your eyes are just barely open. Right? Right? Yeah, you've seen that Jesus died on the cross for you. Believe it. But you don't have real hope that Jesus wants you to have. Amen? You don't have the real hope. When, th when things get down and out, you just, you just, you just quit. Because you don't have real hope. You haven't come to fully realize it yet. Think about this. There's a, there's, there's a parable that Jesus has, and it's one of His most famous parables. It's called the parable of the sower. There's a bunch of different soils. Right? But one of the soils... It looks like great soil because when the seeds hit it, the, the, the plant just begins to come to life. It begins to sprout up. It sprouts up quickly. Comes to life. But then when trials and persecutions and fire and rain and different things come, guess what? That soil is not good enough to hold on. That soil is not good enough to keep going and enduring. And he says, that's like some of you yeah, you've come to know Jesus. At some point, you've come to, the, it, looks like, it looks like it's come to life. It's come to sprout in you. But then one thing hits after another. And you realize that, and, and we realize, people realize that the soil wasn't that good. Because it sprouted. But then the trials came. Quenched it out. The plants died. Right? There are a lot of people in this place that it looks like your plants are about to die. And you need to realize that you have hope in Jesus. Amen? Amen? That the trials of this world are nothing compared to the hope that we have in Jesus. So he says, I want you to have your eyes opened to the hope 
to which God has called you. God has called us as Christians to have an unthinkable hope. An immeasurable hope. God has called us to have, have so much hope that there's nothing in this world that could ever quench it. No matter the trials, no matter the tribulations, no matter the persecution, I have hope that will withstand it. The book of Revelation talks about this a lot. It talks about that as we as believers, we need to endure until the end. I don't know about you, but I pray that I endure until the end. Amen? No matter what the path looks like. God, I have enough hope in you to know that I'm going to make it through this life. All the trials, all the tribulations, I have it. I know it. My eyes have been opened to see the truth. I'm going to make it through this life. I'm going to endure it until the end, no matter what. That's my, that's my prayer for myself and for you. So our eyes need to be opened that we have hope. All right? And here he goes on to talk about two reasons why we have hope. Okay? Two reasons that we have hope. Flip to that next one. Look at this. He says, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? I want to stop there. I should have highlighted a couple more words in this slide. If you're you're highlighting in your Bible, highlight the word inheritance in the saints. Not of the saints. That would be a big difference. Okay? If I'm saying inheritance of the saints, I'm talking about the saints' inheritance. It's not what this is talking about. This is talking about God's inheritance. You're like, what? God has an inheritance? Look at, the, look at the text. Let's just read it real quick. He says that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What is the riches of his, who's his, God's, glorious inheritance in the saints. So what is God's inheritance? You are. You are God's inheritance. At first glance, it's like, God, you got the short end of the stick. Right? We get heaven. We get eternity with no pain, no tears, no cancer, no back pain, no death. No poor. No sick among us. No animals that are trying to kill us. You can reach into a viper pit and we need no big deal. And you get us, God. You got the short end of the stick, God. Right? God doesn't think so. It's exactly what, what Matt was just talking about up here. God does not think he got the short end of the stick. God says, You are my glorious inheritance. You, all you believers, all you saints, you're God's inheritance. And He wants you, amen? He longs for you. He loves you. He wants you. That's why He called you. God wouldn't call you if He didn't want you, amen? Do you believe that? You don't sound like it. God wants you, amen? Say, God wants me. He wants you. You're in, you're, you are God's inheritance. All believers are God's inheritance. Here's, here's the analogy I want to make. I remember watching my friend, Brett. Where you at, Brett? Brett in here? Brett, back there. I remember watching my, watching my friend, Brett. I was in his wedding. I remember watching my friend, Brett, up here, waiting, waiting for his bride to come down that aisle. I've never seen a man cry so much. Never seen a man cry as much as Brett when he saw her come down that aisle. That was, that was his wife. That was his fiance walking down the aisle to be united in marriage with him. He started bawling, crying, and you could hear everybody in the crowd go, oh, right? <laughs> And I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to embarrass them. I'm trying to say it was an amazing thing to see. Yeah. And here's the point of what I'm trying to make is, in the Bible, what is the church called? The Bride of Christ. I'm going to tell you right now that God's reaction when He sees you coming down the aisle is way greater than Brett's. Amen. The Bible says that when somebody comes to know Christ, that what? Who's rejoicing? All the angels in heaven. All of heaven is rejoicing when you come to know Him. 
It's a glorious and wonderful thing. You are God's inheritance just as the church is the bride of Christ. It's his possession. It's his inheritance. He wants you, amen? That is amazing. And that should give you so much hope to know I can go through anything in this life because eventually I'm going to be with my God face to face. I'm going to be with my God in perfect unity with my God where sin cannot corrupt that relationship anymore. There is no sin there. There is no death there. There is no shame there. There is no pain there. Perfect relationship with God like the Garden of Eden. Amen? You are God's inheritance. He loves you and He wants you. That should give you hope, amen? That's Paul's first reason. That's just the first reason that He gives for your hope. So I don't care what is happening in your life right now. You should have joy and hope. I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Job still had hope. Yes, he was in despair at times, but he never gave up. His faith never failed. No matter what his friends said, no matter what the people around him said, no matter, what, no, matter what, no matter what the devil tried to throw at him, he killed his family, he killed everything, he took everything away from him. He endured until the end. Right? Endured until the end. Paul says, you need to have your eyes opened to the fact that God wants you and you're his inheritance. Church, you are God's inheritance. He wants you. Second is this. Look at this next part. He says, you're, you're God's inheritance. And then verse 19, he says, What is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe? So I want to stop there for a second. God says, or Paul is saying, God has given power to those who believe in him. Look at this. According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. So he, look at this, look at, look at what he says. He said, the power, the same power of God that was at work in Christ when he raised him from the dead is now in us, is working in us. Look at, look at it again. And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand and in the heavenly places. He says, God had the power. He's given you power in the Spirit. He's given you power in the Holy Spirit. Amen? What does the Bible say in other places? He says, God didn't give you a spirit of fear and timidness but he gave you a spirit of power right he gave you a spirit that is not afraid but a spirit that is powerful lives within you so why do we walk around why are people who have the spirit walking around scared to death because we haven't realized the full power that we have amen I mean, we, God says that we have the power because the Spirit lives within us and God has, has given us, he's, He says, His power towards us who believe. But yet we walk around scared to death, in fear, trembling. Like, that's the, that's the Spirit God gave us. Paul says, no, God didn't give you a spirit of timidness and fear. God gave you a spirit of power. God gave you a spirit of power. You can get through anything because you have the Holy Spirit of power living within you. Amen? You can get through it all because the Holy Spirit lives within you. Notice that. And how do we know that this is true? How do we know that we have real hope? Because we already have a great example. We already have a great example. What is that example? The fact that it looked real gloomy on Friday. The fact that it looked real bad on Friday. Jesus is hanging on a cross, experiencing the same death as thieves on both sides. He's experiencing the same death that thousands of other people have experienced by the Romans. 
And his mom is down there crying. He looks at the Apostle John and he says, that's your mother now, right? Because I'm about to die. All the disciples at this point, besides John, are where? Gone. The Bible says they scattered because they were scared, right? They were scared. Friday looked real gloomy. Saturday, I'm going to tell you, looked just as gloomy, Amen. Right? This, this man that I've been following for three and a half years, he said he, was, he did all these amazing things, but then it's over. He's dead. He's in a tomb. I saw him. He was buried. But then look what it says. Hmm. It says that same power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. We have a great example for us. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, is what the Bible says. Guess who are the rest to be born from the dead? Saints, right? Jesus, His death, burial, and resurrection are an example of exactly what God is going to do for all of us, all of His saints, His bride. Amen? That's what he's doing. This is why when when things look really, really gloomy, I know that there's a Sunday coming eventually. I don't know when that Sunday's coming. It may come tomorrow. It may come Thursday. It may come come a year from now. There may be a Sunday. There may be a breakthrough. There may be a resurrection. There may be something happen. But here's what I do know. That one day there's going to be a Sunday. Whether that means I die and I am buried and I immediately go and be with Jesus. There's a Sunday right there, amen? There's a resurrection day. That's not the end though. It's not the end, it's not the final, right? I know that one day if Jesus comes back, if I die or Jesus comes back, There's going to be a Sunday, and when Jesus comes back, all the saints are going to meet Him in the sky, and they're going to be changed. They're going to be resurrected. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is not just something we, we just remember. It's something that's going to happen for us. I know that I have hope because the resurrection happened. I know that I have hope because God is powerful. If He's powerful enough to raise Jesus from the dead, He's powerful enough to raise me from the dead. Right? I already have the example. So Paul gives us two reasons why we need to have an immeasurable hope that will get us through anything. Number one, you are God's inheritance, meaning He loves you and He wants you. You're His inheritance. And God doesn't think He got the short end of any stick. Amen? He doesn't. Second, God is all-powerful. He's the all-powerful being who raised Jesus from the dead. What makes you think He can't raise you from the dead? What makes you think He can't get you out of your situation? The resurrection is the key to hope. The resurrection of Jesus is the key to my hope, is the key through getting through anything. That's what Paul is making clear. I can go through this life and I can endure it all because one day I will be resurrected. How do I know that? Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus was resurrected. Do you have real hope this morning? Real, authentic hope that can only be found in a God who loves you and a God who sent His Son to die on the cross, but more importantly, He was raised on the third day. You have an example. Do you have real hope?